Um, okay, I think, I think we can get started. Uh, but before we do, I just wanted to note that on the Slack channel, um, I think it was Russ, like addressed a bunch of questions from last week and I put those into our Q&A doc. It was really fun fodder for discussion. So thanks for everyone for posing those questions, especially um, how does vectorization make your code faster? Because I feel like I can finally articulate that now and that's like a huge feat. Yay, go R. Okay, um, so with that, Scott, I'm excited to hear what you got. All right, well, let's, uh, let's give this a try. Hopefully you can all see the slides now, right? Yep. All right. So um, here we go with chapter four on subsetting. And, you know, these are the various sections. There's an intro up front, and then, uh, you know, it talks through how do you, how do you select um, multiple elements. And I found it interesting that it started with that rather than a single element. Normally you start with like simple stuff and then build the more complex, whereas this sort of went the other way, which was interesting. And then we talk about the idea of doing um, subsetting and assignment at the same time. And then we'll move into some applications, which is, you know, why is this useful to know? And I guess technically that should be 4.1 up there on the intro. I'll correct that before I post these tonight. Okay, so the intro piece here is, uh, they say there are six ways to subset atomic vectors, and we talked about what those atomic vectors were um, last week. And there are three different operators we can use to, uh, to do that with, bracket, 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 and dollar sign. And depending on what type of a vector you're using them with, and you know, we, we talked about these as well, the atomic vectors, lists, matrices, data frames, uh, factors, of course, um, depending what vector type you're using them with, they maybe behave the same or behave differently. Uh, I already mentioned the fact that we can combine these two things of subsetting and assignment into one operation um, called subassignment. And then, um, you know, subsetting, um, they mentioned is viewed as a complement to, to structure, which shows you everything about an object or all the pieces of it, whereas this one lets you reach in and grab just the ones you care about for some reason. And um, sometimes, you know, takes a little bit of exploration to figure out which ones you want and need to subset. All right, so starting off with selecting multiple elements, this is where the bracket operator starts. And we can use this to select any number of elements from any type of vector in one of apparently six different ways. So I did make an attempt to use examples from the beer data set that we said we were gonna to try to use. You'll see that I partially succeeded in that as we move through here. Um, some places I, I did some things, others I kind of ran out of time and used some of the examples from the book, but hey, it's a start. So you can see here I grabbed the, uh, the one CSV file that, uh, that's out there in the data set, which is this one here on brewer size underscore size.csv. I read that in with read CSV and I just did a little bit of summarization with it to get, you know, how many brewers, how many barrels, just so we had some vectors to work with that were out of the data set. And uh, you can see here, number of brewers has, I think, um, uh, I think it has 11, um, yeah, 11 elements here. You can see that over time, uh, the number of brewers grew. If you know, you, it's not apparently obvious from just this factor that this is over the period 2010 to 2019, but that's what it is. And then the number of barrels also, um, you know, appears to have grown. But you know, they're kind of really big numbers that when you first look at them, don't uh, aren't real clear. Although, actually, now that I'm looking at it, it looks like the number of barrels is actually somewhat decreasing. I haven't done any you know, visualization or exploration here, but we'll, we'll use these later on. All right, so the first couple of approaches, and remember I said there's six of them, I've combined them two to a page in an attempt to uh, just not use too many slides and cover the high points. So first off, we've got positive integers, which give you the elements at the position of those numbers. So, you know, and Brewer's two there, we can use it for a single element. Hey, wait a minute, aren't we doing multiple elements here? Yes, we are, but it works for a single element too, just realize that. Um, we'll talk a little later on about why maybe you don't want to do that. Um, 
But uh, here you can see in the second example where it lets you, you know, with the, um, the you know, the C operator there or C function pick, you know, selected ones like the first, the 11th and the 12th. And I deliberately put 12 there when this, uh, when this vector only has 11 elements, just to show you that you get an NA if you try with a, an index that's out of bounds. Or you can do it over a range like from 4 to 6. So that all works fine. Well, if we use a negative integer instead of a positive integer, um, then it excludes the elements at those positions. So if we exclude the one at the 11th position, we get the first 10. If we exclude the ones at the negative 1 through negative 5 position, it just looks really weird to me to write that, but that's what it is. Um, it, it leaves the first five off and we get the last six. And one of the notes down here at the bottom is you cannot mix positive and negative integers in a subset. It just doesn't work. It gives you an error. Scott, can you put the, uh, the minus sign outside of the parentheses in the last case, or do you have to do it on both ends like that? Um, I found this is how it worked. Okay. Um, and, this, and I think as I was looking through the, uh, as I was looking through the book, this might have been one that didn't actually have. No, it looks like you can. I think you're right. So in the example in the book, it has the minus sign outside the, in front of the C. So it looks like you can do it that way or this way. Good, good call. Cool, but, thanks. But you can't mix positive and negative. I, I tried that when it gave an error. I figured I didn't necessarily need to show you that, but it, it does. Okay. Um, our approaches three and four to selecting multiple elements are logical vectors where we pick elements that correspond to who or with a corresponding logical value are true. And this is probably, as you'll see in some of the um, examples or applications towards the end of uh, the chapter, one of the more useful things. We often want to you know, specify some condition and figure out if it's true or not, and then do some subsetting based on whether it is true or not. So here I just, you know, put in a bunch of trues and falses and, you know, selected every other one. It works. Um, another way would be to specify a condition where the elements in that vector meet a certain condition, like, you know, they're greater than 10,000. What, what years, you know, or which were the, uh, the number of brewers in years where there were more than 10,000? It turns out it's, you know, the last four there. Or in between two, you know, we can we can add some some boolean in here to uh, to combine two conditions like between four and nine thousand brewers, and it picks out some of the ones in the middle. Um, one of the things about this um, sort of subset operator is that the the usual recycling rules in R do apply. So like if I give it this true true false here, um, it's just going to repeat that true true false true true false true true false until it runs out of of space there. So, um, you know, you just have to be careful a lot of the times to, uh, to make sure that that's what you really want, especially if your, your vector is not a multiple of the, the length of the, the subset, uh, you know, element or logical vector you give it here. Okay, the, the fourth type is nothing where it just gives you back the original vector itself. Um, the book mentions that it's useful for matrices, data frames, and arrays. You know, in, in the case of a simple vector like this, it probably isn't, uh, isn't as helpful, but that's what it does. Does anybody know of a case where that's something that you would really want to do rather than just, you know, using the original vector itself? No. <laughs> Okay, I couldn't think of an example either. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something that that was obvious. Thanks. All right. Approaches five and six. If we put a zero in inside the single bracket, we get a zero length vector. I mean, it just gives us numeric zero back. And there's a comment in here about it being helpful for generating test data. And this isn't something I've really done, but I, I suppose I could see where if you want to try what happens if I feed a, uh, a zero length vector into a particular function and see what happens, you could do this, but I could think of other ways to do this too that would be more intuitive to me, I guess. So I'm not sure I really get the point of this, but I'm open to suggestions. 
And then the sixth approach is character vectors, where it will return elements of vectors with names. I, um, well, okay. So I was, I was, this was where I was getting a little rushed here. So I was still using the, the M Brewers one. So that's where these numbers are still coming from. But I was running into problems with, uh, with the names I was trying to use. So I just quickly substituted in the letters, you know, the first 11 letters of the alphabet to make it easy. And then I can subset based upon these names here, which notice, you know, are in the, in the quotes there. Um, once I've set the names, then I can select them from the names here as well. And one thing to note is you can repeat the indices and you'll get the same, um, you know, same result back again. And then there's a whole bunch of discussion in there about subsetting with factors is not a good idea. Um, and I didn't dig too deeply down that rabbit hole. Might be an interesting place to go, but I just read it and said, okay, I'll not do that. So anyway, those are the six approaches. So we talked about what? Positive integers, negative integers, um, logical vectors, nothing, zero, and character vectors. Those were the six. Six ways to select multiple elements. And oh, by the way, you can use it to select a single one if you want to, too. Okay, what if we instead are dealing with a list, a matrix, or an array instead of a vector? Well, for lists, it's the same as a atomic vector. Amazing how you see these things when you're presenting them that you didn't earlier. Um, one of the key points here though, the difference between bracket and bracket bracket and dollar sign, the other two operators that we're going to talk about a bit later, is that for a list, a single bracket always gives you a list back, whereas the other two let you pull out um, elements. And we'll, we'll talk about that more later. And then for matrices and arrays, there's three ways here to uh, select multiple elements. So we can use multiple vectors, we can use a single vector, or we can use a matrix. So here are some of the examples of doing this with um, matrices and arrays. So here I'm creating a matrix out of the first 10 elements out of that uh, N Brewers vector. I'm just making it have two rows and five columns just so we have a matrix. I don't know why I would really ever do this in, you know, with things that I knew were time series data, but bear with me. Um, if I just want to pick the first row here, you know, it's, it's the name of that matrix A bracket one comma, which essentially is read as the first row and the comma here with nothing after it means all columns. So that gets me the first row, all columns. If I want instead the second and third columns, I would instead inside the bracket here start off with a comma, meaning all rows, and then the second through the third columns. And there you can see the results. We can indeed use this giving a row and a column number. Um, you know, so A bracket two comma four close bracket would give us the element in the second row and the fourth column, which is 10,192. I think everybody, this is the part of the stuff you looked at and said, I know how to do this. This isn't hard. Yeah, we, we, I think we've all done enough to, uh, to know this. So. I'm going to move on. Um, what about data frames? Well, data frames are a bit different because they're, well, they're like lists and they're like matrices. They have some of the characteristics of each of them. And depending how we do this, if we try to subset with just a single index, they act like a list. If instead we give them two indices, well, then they act like a matrix. And Here's an example where I have now created a data frame where I've, you know, made this, uh, you know, first column here, the year from 2009 to 2013. The second one, I pulled out the first five elements of that N Brewers vector. And then I added a third one, which is the production or the number of barrels. And I grabbed the first five from there. You're not seeing them. If I were to show you B, you would see the, the production column in there. But then what I've done immediately is just selected the first two columns, so one to two. So if I just give them a single index like this, it acts like a list. And you can see what happens. Whereas if I give it, um, you know, like are shown in some of these other examples down here, it behaves more like a matrix. So two comma gives me the whole second row, four two gives me that fourth row, second column. 
um, which is 4860. And yeah, one of the things here, it points out the difference between um, how it acts like a list and how it acts like a matrix. So if we say, you know, hey, give me, show me the structure of um, B subsetted on year, you know, in quotes there, you notice what we get back is it's a data frame. Um, whereas if we do B bracket comma, then year in quotes and, and bracket, um, it acts like a matrix and we actually get a vector back. So it is different here, as, as you can see, that's what this, this was talking about up here. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we were talking earlier about the, the way I wanted to combine bullets and sub bullets and R chunks, and it wasn't working the way I wanted. So one of the things you're gonna find is in some of these, all the text is at the top and then all the R is at the bottom, even though I would have liked to have had it interleaved for easier reading in my mind. Okay, um, tibbles. When we're selecting multiple elements from tibbles, if we use a single bracket, it always gives us a tibble back. There are a number of examples shown here, and you can see using the structure command that you get tibbles back. I have to admit, I'm a tibble newbie. I use data frames all the time. I just haven't really seen the point in going to tibbles, and I'd love to be shown at some point why I should, but data frames seem to do everything I need them to. Oh, you will. We'll get there. <laughs> Okay. This, Thank this you. book is the reason. It's what? This book is the reason why I've slowly been migrating to Tibbles. Okay. Well, I'm not there yet. So I don't understand why I should want to use them because everything I've ever done, I've been able to do with a data frame. Yeah. Maybe it's just easier in some cases. But anyway, brackets work on Tibbles too. <laughs> All right. There's a section in here on preserving dimensionality. And um, you know, the general idea here is if we take our matrix or our data frame, um, and this may be part of the reason here in this, in this slide, I guess, um, this drop equals false versus drop equals two true bit. Um, if, if we take in subset of matrix or data frame with just a single number, it's gonna give us, the object that it gives us back is going to have lower dimensionality by default. Um, but we, because it defaults to drop equals true, um, we can change it with a drop equals false explicit, um, you know, what's the word I want to switch, argument, whatever. Um, but um, I guess tibbles default to drop equals false because drop equals two creates issues. And, um, you know, the, the recommendation is if you're using drop equals true a lot, you should probably use a character vector instead of a factor, or I guess the way I read that was, or use a tibble instead of something else. But anyway, you can see down at the bottom here, the difference in a behavior with, uh, with that um, matrix that I had set up earlier. Um, now this was the one that had two row A, the matrix A was the one that had two rows and five columns. Um, and if I just do, you know, one comma with the default, um, unstated drop equals true, you see that what I get there um, is different than what happens if I do it from the drop equals false in terms of the dimension. You know, it, the, in the first case, it's giving me a vector back. In the second case, as I understand it, it's giving me a matrix back with one row. Does that match what others understand? Okay. All right. So we get to the trains. Um, we're now talking about getting a single element, and there are two operators we can use for doing this, bracket, bracket, or dollar sign. Um, and dollar sign is essentially just a shorthand for bracket, bracket. Um, so I guess if you type like it shows here, you know, X dollar sign Y, you, you, you hit three keys, whereas if you type X bracket, bracket, quote, Y bracket, or sorry, end quote, bracket, end bracket, end bracket, you know, you, you save five keystrokes. So I guess that's one benefit. Um, plus, it just looks, I guess, a little cleaner. Um, generally speaking, double bracket or bracket bracket are used with lists because they give you a list back. And I like this uh, this example here with the the train of cars 
to show the difference between bracket and bracket bracket because you know if you're only selecting a single element both work um, but they're not really actually the same thing that you're getting back um, so created a simple list here well I didn't this was I used the example out of the book here because I didn't want to make my own frames um, simple list here of the numbers from one through three the letter a and the numbers four through six so spread out into you know three train cars behind the locomotive there is what x is and if we do x bracket one bracket we get you know the locomotive with the first car which contains the numbers two one two three whereas if we use the double bracket operator we actually just get the contents of the first car um, so okay that sort of makes sense and you know depending what you're going to do with it, it it may make a difference or it or it may not i think is what i have found all right let's talk about the bracket bracket a little more um, one of the things about it is it only gives you a single element back so you can only put a single uh you know number positive integer to be specific or a single string in there um, you, anything else it's going to give you an error that if i remember is not particularly useful. Um, if you use this, if you use a vector with it, it, it does this recursive um, subsetting. And there's an example here of what happens if we put a, a vector, you know, with two elements, one and two there, and you see what it translates to equivalently, which, um, you know, I have found that with lists, sometimes this is, this is helpful when you're trying to work your way down through elements of you know, nested lists, for example. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, so yeah, here's an example down here about, you know, using a single number and the difference between single bracket and, and double bracket. And, you know, if you're just picking a single number out of a simple atomic vector, it doesn't appear to make much of a difference. And then the book goes into, but if you're doing something like this, where you've got these sort of, um you know recursive or that's not really the right word yeah i guess it is kind of a recursive function it, it makes a difference i yeah I, I didn't get this too much um anybody want to weigh in here as to why it really makes a difference because i i'm not sure i still get it Can you repeat that? Sorry. So this this last code chunk down at the bottom, mm -hmm. somehow the use of double brackets versus single brackets makes a difference. And, and I think they're making the argument in the book that the double bracket is better. Whereas for something simple like the, hey, get me the seventh element out of number of brewers, it really doesn't matter. Um, but in more complicated things, it, it appears to make a difference to to use a single element. They're trying to say, don't use single brackets to, to extract a single element. That's a good question that I do not have the answer yeah. to. I don't know. I'm gonna but write it down. It seems to be an important point. Yeah. I just- I just can't think of a use case, you know? Yeah, I think what in the book somewhere, um, it mentions that like the double bracket kind of syntax, but like always work or, Something where the yeah, double bracket is guaranteed to work under more situations than just a single bracket. Like with a single bracket, if it's like like a list and it's like a nested list, then you can get a list back. Whereas I think the double bracket is supposed to always return like single character, numeric integer. Okay. Uh, it's a double check that, but. Uh, that's what I remember reading at some point. Okay, thank you. All right, the dollar sign. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's a shortcut with, you know, X dollar sign Y being roughly equivalent to X bracket bracket Y close bracket close bracket. Um, and, you know, this is how I first I think I probably learned the dollar sign before I learned the double brackets, to be honest, you know, the first time I learned R, and I think that's fairly 
common for those of us who learned it a while ago. Um, but um, I just saw a question in the chat. Um, what was the question? X dollar sign one is the same as the third. As the third what? I'm not sure. That might be from like two slides back. Or... Oh, train. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I don't know if that works. Does it? Maybe. I don't know. It doesn't. I think, and I could be wrong here. This is like what I wanted to talk about at the end. Um, I think that like dollar sign being a shorthand carries over more for data frames. Okay. Well, we can play with it and see what happens. I mean. Yeah. Well, I think it's shorthand in the special case where it's a quoted string. So like that Y is in quotes. So it's where you want to use the name to index from the list. Okay. Yeah, that's why I've never seen it used with a dot with a number after the dollar sign. It's always been. Oh, okay. Go name. back. Go back to the train. Sure. So you see where it says uh, list one through three. If if we were to assign like my string or my numbers, whatever equals one two three, then you could do x dollar sign my numbers or whatever you're calling that thing but because as darren said because these are unnamed we can't you can you can't access it using the dollar sign okay that sense? i think so i think so i can uh, at the end do like a screen share okay cool good questions all right um so one of the one of the points is that um, people commonly make a mistake of using the dollar sign when the name of a column is stored in a variable. And, and you'll note my my comment in the, the code chunk down there that says, hey, I was trying to put something here with the beer data example. There's an empty cars example in the book that I refused to use just because I didn't want to. And uh, I, I will go back and add one in here. But um, it um, it was pretty clear that if you have names, you can't. You know, if the names are stored, you know, in the variable, it, you know, it doesn't work. There was an example there um, on page 83 of the book and instead use double brackets. So it sounds like double brackets always work. Sometimes, though, the, the dollar sign doesn't work in some situations. Okay. I need to go back and clean that up. Okay, let's talk about sub-assignment, which is this, let's combine two things at once. Let's... Um, um, Oh, by the way, I skipped, there's a whole section that I skipped here on, it was 4.33 missing and out of bounds indices. Um, and then partially I did this because it all went into per and pluck and a bunch of stuff I've never seen and I just wasn't sure what to do with it. Um, I did mean to put that table in there though to indicate the difference between error and nulls and I'll go back and do that. But. Um, I think there's a whole functional chapter dedicated to map later. So good idea just glancing over that. Okay. Um, so sub-assignment is this, this combination of any of these operators, um, you know, be it single bracket, double bracket, or dollar sign, but then using it um, combined with an assignment operator. So here, for example, you know, we can do things like, you know, just select, uh, for example, and say, hey, I want to assign the fifth element of n brewers to the number 42, or I want to assign the first and second elements to, you know, these numbers that maybe you remember from science class from a long time ago, um, or look vaguely familiar. Um, and you can see what happens after we do that here. Of course, you know, the formatting of it changes a bit since I gave one to, uh, to three decimals here you know, with the, the golden uh, ratio there and whatnot. But um, this was another place there was a caution about making sure that the, the length of what you're trying to, you know, assign is the same length of what you're trying to 
you know, provide in there, you know, there's two things here, there's only one here, you know, make sure you don't, because otherwise the, the recycling rules get a little bit complicated and messy. I mean, I know I've done this plenty of times. It's, it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. All right, so then we get to these applications. And um, there's a mix of them. Some of them rely on characters, some of them rely on integers, some of them rely on, on Boolean. So that's what the sort of subtitle here on each of these upcoming slides is. Um, so you can make lookup tables using character matching. Um, and then they bring out this idea of um, using the unnamed command to get rid of the name. So I, uh, I read in a different file here from the, uh, the beer data. This one was brewing materials. And I just said, hey, give me the first letter out of the type variable in, in brewing materials. And I just picked the first 15 of them um, just so that I would have, um, you know, some letters that I could use as, um, as names and then here in the lookup, I assign that each one of these letters means something as far as one of the types of materials. And then we can do a lookup on these different types on the types object and you can kind of see here and it does this. And if you use the unname on that lookup, then it just gives you these without the, you know, without the single letter names. So it's pretty much the same example as was in the book, but with something from the, the beer data set. Um, I haven't really ever done this deliberately, although thinking back, I've probably done something like it in the past, you know, without really thinking about it. So it could be useful. Yeah, same. I thought this was really nifty. This was my first contact with using, uh, with using it in, in like the context of a lookup table. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it this way, but like I say, I think I've, I think I've done it without knowing that's what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one on matching and merging, well, what happened? Okay, we got a problem. This was the thing I was finishing up at 7.57 before logging in. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to fix this one, but um, one of the reasons I delayed this one until the end was it was another one I looked at it and I was kind of like, eh, I don't know. Um, but it, it makes use of the match command, as you can see here, which I've used in the past, but um, has always provided issues. Um, I, have, I have found, I tend to do these things in other ways now. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I thought, so I thought this was an elegant, like I brute force love doing um, like left joins. And that's kind of what this match function is doing that you have some me metadata and can match it to the original data frame. At least that was kind of my understanding of like when I would use this. Um, I don't know, I really like this part of the chapter just like vomiting a bunch of use cases. Uh, yeah. This one, this one I haven't really I don't think I've done it this way in a, in a long time. And by the way, my R is very rusty. I'm getting back into it because I used it a lot, you know, a decade ago and then I've been doing other things and I'm now just getting back into it, which is why I signed up for this. So, awesome. Um, you know, I figured to uh, jump from the frying pan into the fire or whatever. So I have some things to clean up here and we'll do so and, and we'll post them. Um, okay, this one, this one I get, this one I like, um, random sample and bootstrapping. We can use these to um, randomly sample or bootstrap a vector using the sample command. I've, I've done this plenty. Actually, I used it the other day in class just to uh, figure out the order my students were going to uh, give their presentations in. Um, just a real trivial example. But um, so we've made a data frame here, this, this B data frame. I, I had used this before. You just had never seen the production column before. Um, but here's what it looks like. And notice that it's still carrying along some of these, you know, freaky values that I've edited before. So I haven't like completely loaded the data again. And um, we can randomly reorder them right here by sampling and taking, you know, the same number of samples as the, the number of rows that we have. And, uh, you know, the comma here and basically saying, give me all columns. So here they all are. You notice they show up in order 51324 this particular time. 
you know, I run it again, I, I very well could get something, likely would get something very different. Since there's, you know, quite a few different options there with five things and how many ways can you order that. Um, continuing this along, we can do the same thing here, but we could say, you know, I only need, you know, two of them. So here I'm picking two rows. It happened to give me the fifth and the fourth. Or if I want to bootstrap it and allow, you know, the row, each row to come up more than once, I can add this replace equals true one here to sample. And here you can see that I'm getting, you know, 10, uh, a bootstrap of 10 um, samples from the original five. And what you notice start happening is this is the first time that one comes up an additional time. Here's the first time that one comes up, uh, or three comes up an additional time. And then, you know, like when we get down here, one has come up now three times total. This is the sort of second extra time or additional occurrence of it. I, I find this somewhat useful for, you know, doing a little bit of simplified, uh, you know, simulation or sampling. Okay. Ordering, we can... It's got... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. We have a question in the chat. Um, oh, okay. Seeing... I didn't see that. Sorry. Yeah, um, it might be from a little while back. Copy, modify, or is the same object overwritten? I'm guessing that was from back when we were talking about subassignment, or uh, I don't know where the question is relative to. Let it, if you can let us know which uh, which part you were talking about or asking about there, we can we can go back to it and discuss it. But I'm just not sure where to reference. I mean, I'm guessing it was back here on this. But oh, sorry, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm running the the video on my computer and the audio on my. Uh, phone so it was muted in <laughs> different places so um no what i meant to say was uh, remember that example i'm so sorry yeah it, it's actually this one where you assign um you know the i don't know is that the avogadro number or something i don't know what that is but uh it looks vaguely familiar but are you creating another object or is this overriding it or is it like the it like what we saw earlier is it is it like a copy and you're modifying I'm gonna get, I'm gonna defer to one of the people with a CS background on that one. Who, who wants to take that one? I don't know. So like you know here where we're doing this, or even even in the simpler case here, I guess we'd have to dig into that with um, tracement. Yeah. 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 Um, so. No worries, I can try that. I, it was just a question. I don't know. It's a good question. I, I suspect it would be copy and modify because um, there could be multiple names bound to that data. Okay. So you wouldn't want to... Um, if you only want to modify the data associated with one name, you have to copy and modify. Got it. Okay, seems reasonable. But I, I, I think doing the trace map might be the only way to verify it, to do with an example. Okay, thank you. All right, um, on to another application, which is ordering, which if we use the order function here and give it a vector, it will give us, um, an integer vector talking about the order of the subsetted vector. Um, so for example, here were, you know, here were these types that we talked about earlier, um, you know, which were the different types of uh, ingredients used in, in making beer. And then it would talk about how to order them. And, you know, it would do this. Well, what, what you notice is what, what do you notice here? I mean, it, you know, it says this one would be first, which is what? Well, that's this B right here, which is the first letter 
you know, alphabetically in this, in this vector. The next one is going to be C here, so 2. But notice that this one here, 3, is this O. So, you know, how do you know which C is which? And that's, this is this, um, you know, it's tied at this point. But if you wanted to, you could add additional variables, you know, beyond this one to, to break ties, like a, a second level sort or order, if you will. Another thing is for ordering this way, you can change by default, it goes in increasing order, but you can put decreasing equals true to, uh, to go to descending instead of ascending. And you know, you get it in reverse um, alphabetical or numerical if, they, if these were numbers order. And um, you know, if you have more dimensions than one, I've only shown one here, um, we can use it either to order the rows or the columns. So that's useful. Um, a little bit more here. I mentioned about uh, making it easier to order the rows or the columns. You can kind of see here. So here's this. Uh, here's this. I forget if this was a matrix or a data frame. I guess it's a data frame. Um, and we're ordering it now by the number column here. So if you look, you know. Here's the smallest value in the number column, then the next, and you know, all the way up till the largest. So we've reordered it according to the number column. Or we can order the columns according to the names, you know, where now they're in order, alphabetical order in this case, number prod year, num, num prod year. Whereas if you were to look back at the original, well, actually we can just look here at this one. This is the way it was. They were in the order year num prod. So we can use it to reorder in either rows or columns. All right, um, another type of character subsetting here is this expanding aggregated counts. So we've been given, um, you know, sometimes data is stored differently. Sometimes rather than getting all the data you get, you know, here are the, here are the, the items, in this case maybe rows that have all been, uh, that appear, and here's the number of times that each of them are. So if we, you know, we're given it this way where X is this, you know, 2, 4, 1, Y is 9, 11, 16, or sorry, 9, 11, 6, and then the number of times that each of these appear, 3, 5, and 1. So if you look, you know, here's the three occurrences of um, 2 and 9, here's the five occurrences of 4 and 11, and here's the one occurrence of 6. Um, what we can use this for, though, is um, you know they're actually using the subsetting operator right here now to basically give you the whole data set back from this sort of compressed version of it. At least that's my read on on what it's doing for us. And of course, we have to use the the repeat operator here or replicate, I guess technically it stands for. I say repeat, but I think it's replicate if I remember. Okay, so I mean, I can remember, you know, doing stuff in SPSS and other, you know, other, you know, statistical packages where it would want the data one way or another. And of course, you know, now there are other ways to, uh, to do this too, but this, this is effective or efficient, I think. Um, we can remove columns from data frames. A um, couple of different ways we can do this. We can basically just say, hey, give me the ones that, uh, you know, that I want or keep only the ones that I want. Or you can use this and say, keep all the ones except um, the one that I don't want here, you know, with this set diff um, operator. We can select rows based on a condition, and this is, you know, one of the more useful things, I think, and it doesn't just have to be, I'm sorry, we can subset based on conditions, and it doesn't have to be from just one, um, you know, one variable, one column. I mean, it can be. We could say, hey, give me all the rows where there were at least 4,000 producers, and I'd see that that, you know, gives me these three results, or I could say, give me the ones where there's at least 4,000 producers and it was less than 2013. Turns out in this case, they're the same. I probably should have put a 12 here in, uh, instead. All right, what else? Um, Boolean algebra versus sets talks about when you want to find the first or last occurrence of a true, or you have a, uh, 
you know, a lot of falses or very few trues, so kind of a sparse, um, you know, data set here, and you want to store it in a more efficient way. It talks about how to do that using which. It mentions the fact that there is no unwitch, but then they give us one here. Um, if we look at what the, what the witch does here, um, this, so if you think about it, this is what, this is a sample here of, you know, 10 numbers, and then it gives us, you know, which of those are less than four, and it says, hey, you know, these are the positions that came up as less than four. Um, and then we could see, you know, using this on which function that it indeed is one, four, and seven that are true, that meet the, the specified Boolean condition or logical condition. And then of course, there's all these sorts of fun things to do, like, you know, using a modulo operator to figure out which numbers are even or which ones are divisible by five without a remainder. And then doing things like intersections, unions, um, and um, I'm trying to think of the name for the last one there. Um, it has a name, but I can't remember it. But anyway, these are all sorts of things we can use to subset, you know, that meet certain conditions. And I think the last or nearly last thing I've got here yet is the last slide, is uh, they point out a mistake, which is trying to use the, the subset operator here, something like this, x, which, y instead of just x of y. And it might not create a problem from what I understand, but it might. But you know what's really happening is we're switching here from logical to inner subsetting. But in this example, it, it maybe doesn't really do anything, but it can make a difference in certain cases. And they just point out, you know, hey, don't do this unless you really, really want to for a good reason. And that's what I've got for chapter four. So. Awesome. Thank you. Stop the share and let's talk. Uh, that was really informative. And uh, thanks for bringing in the beer data. I am not going to lie. I haven't looked at it yet, but. Uh, I've seen a little bit now. That's given me the impetus to look at it a little bit more. Um, so I kind of wanted, does anyone have any like burning questions? I kind of, I have my own, but um, if anyone wants to shout things out, you can either do that in the chat or interrupt, right? This is just like chill. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my desktop. So, I don't even know if this is, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. I don't even know. I am like last week when I made that like diagram, um, I'm trying to tie these chapters up in like one schematic or like have a high level summary. And I don't even know if you can do this to this topic, but I wanted to talk about what is this operator in the context of like when you do it on an atomic um, vector, a list, a matrix, or a data frame. So uh, I filled these in as, we, as Scott was talking, but like uh, this, if you subset with like a single extraction bracket, then it gives you back, just it gives you back an atomic a vector, right? Isn't it a single element? Well. <laughs> Sorry. I thought it was a single element. It is a single element, but it, it's technically um, but like you can do one colon three and get you know, yeah, so like I just did you know I looked at structure on n brewers, and then I looked at structure on n brewers bracket one, and you know it's still just saying you're getting a number, but it's it's essentially a isn't it just a vector with one element? I mean, I think. That makes sense to me. And then like you can't, you don't do this on an atomic 
vector, correct? You can, <laughs> but... So then when would you use this versus this in an atomic vector? Or are they synonymous? In the case of an atomic vector, at least. Yeah, if you did it in R, And then for the dollar sign, you couldn't use that because, oh, so just to um, switch back to the question about is this that we use in the list, can we just go like this, x dollar sign one? Um, and you cannot do that because the when we were talking about the quote unquote shorthand, it's a shorthand for x name a vector. So like if we named this one through three, I don't, you know what I mean, whatever, then you can access it doing X dollar sign, the name of the thing. You right. can't if you try it, X dollar sign index. Does right. that make if sense? If you try it with the number there, it's going to give you an error that says unexpected numeric constant in exactly. X so dollar we, sign one. I just wanted to clarify when we say shorthand, as Darren, I think, was saying, it's a shorthand for uh, a string or when you name that thing that you're trying to subset. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that was my tangent. Um, so yeah, so this is the same as this, but then in that context of a dollar sign, when, what, the, the atomic vector you can't subset it smaller based on a name because it's already the smallest unit that would have a name or not necessarily. You could set names of your things inside an atomic vector. Learned that last week. And we don't have to struggle with this too long, but I don't know. Do you guys think this is like a worthy mental exercise to go through? I think it's a great exercise. And, and I figured also we, we can like talk over Slack uh, and get other people to help too. But um, does this, even thinking about it in this way, does that make sense? Or am I trying to put things in buckets that can't? I think it makes sense to, I, I guess the, the crux of the question is like, when do you use this with this? When do you use this with this? Does that make sense? Uh, so I have a question, you guys. Um, when I started with R about like three years ago, I have personally never seen those double brackets. Is that like a base R thing that's carried over? Because like Scott said, I have only ever used the dollar. And so like a lot of this is just like bringing back like whatever, like, classes from computer science or whatever. So I like, is this double base bracket thing, is that, is that more of a base R thing that's carried over or is that more recent? I think we need to be careful with like words because the dollar sign is also base R, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're all base R operators. Um, um, I think I personally wanted to make this selfishly because I am very divided between this and this, and now that I'm doing like nasty JSON list, nested list shenanigans, that's when you get into the double brackets. I am not a mathematician. I imagine in matrices and arrays, you have to deal with that all day long as well. But if, you're, if your like contact with R is data frames, then it makes sense that you would be accessing things through the name of the column and not writing. Yeah, I, 
I find myself using the double bracket when I'm doing like nested JSON stuff I've scraped off a website. Exactly. Which when I'm doing sports stuff. That, but What's we'll that? get into, <laughs> use pluck for that. But <laughs> but um yeah, I think I think I've avoided using double brackets until I got listy. It just leaned into how horrible they are. Um, does anyone have any other comments? Yeah, same thing, like double brackets for nested lists. But I, I find, yeah, double brackets is, will work in the same way as single brackets, but sometimes single brackets with lists, you know, if it's a nested list, won't return what you expect. So I kind of almost always default to double brackets and almost never use dollar sign. Just assuming you know, if I, um, I got a column and a data frame, you know, maybe if I know the data frame, you know, all, you know, all the names are, don't have spaces and you know, they don't have numbers leading the, the columns. Yeah. Names. But I think it's just best practice to use the, the most general operator. I, I see the double bracket as like working the best in most scenarios. So I kind of yeah. almost always use that one. Yeah, I thought of another use case. So I'm a Shiny app developer by day. And if you create a like Shiny input that's a column name, when the user selects that column name, it returns a string. So you have to do, you have to do like this, which I might be getting in over my head here, but it, make, it makes sense in certain um, like Shiny context to do that as well. Yeah, I, that, that, that totally makes sense. Like something that's more generalizable, especially if it's like in a function and it's like, oh, I'm going to pa pass a column name. Exactly. Name. That will always work. Okay. So that's kind of my table here. Um, and then. I, yeah. Um, I was just trying it. I don't think the dollar sign works with a named atomic vector. Okay, that's interesting. That was my suspicion. Yeah, I'm sending I'm some. Back rain. Uh, I just sent some code to the chat that I ran. Awesome. And did you know? And perfect. And, gonna... um, yeah, that's exactly what I was on the to-do list. Thank you. Awesome. Um. And then this, Scott, you really uh, cleared up for me. I, I was getting lost in what was meant by that, but now I understand they're both in the context of this single bracket. If you specify one number, you do, you're gonna get a list, whereas you can use like the row, comma, column situation. Um, and then for these, we'll just, I think it, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna put a pin in this and try to cram in all my other questions, at least as a, like a uh, overview to what I'm going to be bugging people about on Slack. Um, okay, there was a question to describe the upper try function, which as you see here, if we have a one through five matrix uh, with one through five rows columns, um, it returns true for everything in the top right corner. And the way that this works is it leverages where the dimensions of X in the rows are less than or equal to the dimensions of X in the columns. And using real numbers here, we can see like you just one and one, one and two, you know, it's evaluating that logical, that logic to the end here. But I, but I wanted to be super nerdy here. So, I, that is this part. That makes sense to me. What is this doing? If length is not equal to T. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Like uh, checking the dimension, by, like it's checking the dimension kind of like indirectly. It's like at least that's what I think it's doing. I think I would have to think of a case where 
this evaluates to true so that this happens. If someone can um, do that in the chat or in the Slack channel. I just cool. wanted to like. If it's like a 3D array, it's uh, like something it wouldn't evaluate. Then it's like forcing it to like a 3D array. Where did this question come from? Uh, the exercises. 4.3.5. It's not in, it's not one of the questions in 4.3.5 in my book. Huh, weird. <laughs> you have version two? I do. That's weird. Um, I mean, I'm using the online. Okay, well, I didn't know that the printed and the online one were different, but now I do. Deadly! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so and then my second question was what what is the how is dot row like what what is that? I guess I could just like question mark that, but is there some like high level when are you putting a period before the name of your function? Uh it seems like I, I, I kinda had that question a while back. I don't know. It feels like it's like a, a way of, um, an archaic way of like saying your internal functions to a package. So I think you'd probably have to look. I don't know where upper try is it in base or stats. You have to look to see if it's a dot row and dot call are defined elsewhere in that package and just not export it. But, you know, I guess before, you know, the whole Roctogen stuff where you could not export functions, I think that was kind of a common way to like signify either to the developers or to the users, like saying, this isn't a function that you should use. It's really just kind of internal to package. Interesting. Um, and I know, I guess the, the dot, any function that starts with a dot doesn't appear in the environments of the game uh, in your wish video. So it's like, it's like the user wouldn't even know to use it because they don't even see it. <laughs> it yeah. In the environment. Okay. Cool. That was another rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And then I think I can go over your slides and fill this out, but um, there's a table in the book, this table here, where... Um, yeah, that's the one I skipped by accident. <laughs> if you have an atomic that's zero length, it'll error. If you have an atomic out of bounds, it'll error. Out of bounds character, out of bounds missing. Um, I just wanted like dumb, easy examples for each of these, but it's already 6.06, so maybe I'll just chalk that up for homework if people are interested. And then um, in the Slack channel, Russ, I, I posed the question about when to use a single dollar sign or pipe versus two. And this is a pretty fun read of it will um, results in some unexpected behavior that you might actually want to leverage where two pipes will not evaluate the second argument when the first is true and two dollar signs will not evaluate the second argument when the first is false. Those dollar you, signs or ampersands? Oh, I'm sorry, ampersands. I, okay. Well, okay. It's getting late. It's um, kind of small on my screen, that's all. Sorry. Is that better? Is that better? Um, and I mean, this is on our GitHub. You all have access to this too. But yeah, that, that was a kind of fun thing. Um, is that different to the single percent and the single bar? That lazy evaluation, that, that, okay, I shouldn't use lazy evaluation. Oh, you're, you're saying that a single one would act like this as well? I am asking, I'm, is that statement not true of, of the single and the... I'm pretty sure it's not, but I, I, I want to go dig back into this and see, you know, run these same things with a single one as opposed to two to confirm that. I don't want to 
blanketly tell you that it's not. I was just under the impression that that's the distinction. Okay. Let me... Is the single one returns a vector? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The, the, okay. the single one. The single one does element-wise comparisons, mm -hmm. whereas the double evaluates left to right, but only I think only looks at like the first element of each vector or something. There's there's somehow a difference. Right. That's and I think that's what this comment is getting at, but. Um, I'm not doing a great job explaining because I clearly don't understand all of it, but I thought that could be a fun thing to read. And if anyone wants to elaborate on, that would be awesome. Okay. Uh, Scott, towards the end, mentioned the unwitch function, which I get what's happening line by line, but I don't understand when you would want to do that. Do you have a use case for that? Other than learning what which does? <laughs> okay. I mean, that's perfectly valid too. I don't know. And then um, my last question was um, also on your last slide uh, where this statement here, um, it was just, I, w I think I was getting caught up in some, in the jargoniness of it. And I know that if we just came up with a little example, we'd be like, oh. So I was wondering if anyone could think up something that would apply to this. Mm. Okay. Okay, so I think that you might have which this is really getting into like computer science theory stuff. Yeah. Um, and then these are just the questions that I posed as we were uh, going through the talk. So yeah, that's that's kind of all I had there. Does anyone have any other questions that I should add to this doc? No? no. I thought this entire chapter is kind of interesting because it shows like so many different ways of doing one thing and I don't know, one thing you hear a lot is like, you want to have one really good way to do something and then almost have like no other options for how to do it. I mean, it just seems pure, like, I guess, talking about programming in general, like, if a language has like a one very clear best way of doing something, isn't that generally better? Um, and, and, you know, it's not like a fault of our anything that there's a lot of options or ways of doing the same thing, but it's just kind of a, I guess interesting just you know taking a step back and thinking about how this kind of falls into the whole realm of programming and all that. Totally. And I think it's it's good too to like, you know, I think a pattern just from the couple times that we've met is like we're all intuitively just doing things that make sense given our work or pipelines or whatever we have to do on a daily basis and not really thinking on a on a broader scope like you just set of like the different flavors of these different things so it's nice to geek out about it yeah no, I'm, I'm all in for doing what's most practical um, exactly. I guess it's, it's great to know all the different ways but it's like at some point you're like okay this is too much info <laughs> yeah totally well I think that's it um again I'll upload this to the github and then I can also post the questions directly in Slack if people like that as a form of communication more, but, and then we can like hammer away at this with the rest of the R4DS community. I will fix up a couple of slides that need some uh, rework and get those posted. And then uh, once the video gets uh, saved, I'll download it and uh, 
get it over up onto the YouTube channel too. Thanks so much, Scott. Your talk was awesome. That was so great. Thank I you. loved it much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks yeah. a lot. Bye.